Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good to see you all uh, under the lights. If I go like this, I can get a good look at you all. These lights are bright, man. Man, we don't got this kind of star power up in Scotts Valley. Uh, but in case you don't know, my name's Chad. Uh, my wife Jillian and I and, and our two kids, Noah and Ava, are the location pastors at our Scotts Valley location. Just a few, a few minutes up the road and uh, get the opportunity right now to make the, make the trip Come down here, teach the gospel, drive back up, teach it there, drive back down, teach it here. So um, keep me in prayer on that, you know? I keep my road rage under control. Traffic and me are not friends. We're not symbiotic. Um, and, so, and I drive, I drive a, a, a large truck, so sometimes the traffic, I get a little, a little steery. Um, so just keep me in prayer that I can have the right heart and the right attitude when I come in to teach about second chances, right? Um, but last week, Chris did an amazing job kicking off Second Chances. Um, my father-in-law said, and I quote, I've been to a lot of church, and I've never heard a story start with the bathroom and a nest. <laughs> and I said, you know what, Rob, you're right. I've never heard that either, and I've been to a lot of church myself. And so we got a little, a little window into Chris Matley, a little TMI in my opinion, so I thought I'd refresh our memory on that. And... Um, so I get, I get a chance to teach on something that I'm very passionate about. I'm very passionate about second chances when given to me. I'm not very passionate about giving them to me. I'm kidding. Um, but I'm very, very passionate about the second chance that Jesus gives us. The second chances that Jesus gives us. I love that following a God that is always willing to give you another chance. To give you another try. Always willing to forgive. Always willing to redeem you. I love that aspect and that, that characteristic of God. Because it's so loving, it's so gracious, and it's so the essence of who he is and what I want to be in my life. And so if I'm going to follow someone, they better be who I want them to be, right? I don't want to follow someone down a path that I don't want to go. So if I'm going to follow Jesus, I, I want to be a characteristic and an attribute that is life-giving, loving, encouraging, and helpful. So that's what uh, I love about second chances because I've had myself a couple. Anyone else out there by a show of hands, you had a couple second chances from Jesus? Maybe like five second chances from Jesus? I got a zero zero on the end of my second chance. A couple zeros. Uh, I got my first chance. I got my first chance when I was 12 years old. My first call to ministry was when I was 12 years old. And I said, no, thank you. Shut that down. I'm going to backpedal away from this life. And I ran for about 10 years. I had about a wasted decade of my life. I'm 33, so it's it's so about a third of my life was just in the nest of Chris Matley. And, and then I got a second chance. And the way God works, and I love it, my second chance was at the same place of my first chance. I was at Old Oak Ranch when I was 12 years old when I felt God call me to ministry. And I said no. And then I was back at Old Oak Ranch 10 years later, and God called me again to ministry. He used that same place for that same call. And that time I actually said yes, so that was pretty cool. That's what led me here. And we're going to look at a, a story in the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament. The New Testament's great. I just, I, the, the Old Testament is just a little bit more theatrical to me. Like when I read it, I'm like, man, that's crazy. It's like there's wars, there's, there's, there's like scandals, there's, there's all kinds of theatrics and crazy stuff that happens and I'm a history buff I love history so like maybe it's that part going to the Old Testament and this historical stuff but there's this character named Rahab and she has a small little episode in the Bible but when you really start to dig in it's pretty large it's pretty big and Rahab's got one of the gnarliest stories I've ever really experienced when you start to dig in and break it down and so we're going to look at Rahab. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in Joshua chapter 2. Now, it's a pretty large chunk, so I'm not going to read it verbatim. I don't even like to hear myself read that that much in a row. I stumble over words, like dyslexia and stuff. It's fun. It's fun. Get in my head, guys. It's fun. But I'm just going to paraphrase it for you. So if you want, I highly encourage you to go and read Joshua chapter 2. Um, it's so cool. But we pick up, we pick up this passage story right at the heels of Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt. So we pick up this story. Moses loses his opportunity to go to the promised land. 
which is sad. It's sad, but hey, disobedience, consequence. Teaching my four-year-old that right now, action, consequence. Bad action, bad consequence. You lose toys if you throw them. Um, so Moses, he disobeyed what God asked him to do, and so he lost, he lost out on the promised land. He led to the promised land, but then he had to pass the baton to Joshua, and Joshua led into the promised land. Now, a, a quick little side note on this is that the work didn't stop when they got to the promised land. Anyone ever been, uh, had a promise from God and they, you got to the promise and you thought it was going to be smooth sailing, easy breezy, sunshine and rainbows from there on, and then you wait, wait a minute, I still have to work? I still have to try? I still have to do? Yeah. So they got to the promised land and Joshua and the Israelites now had to start to conquer the cities in the promised land. They weren't just going to go, oh, you're here? Yeah, come on in, have it. Yeah, cool. We'll go. We're gonna, we'll go find somewhere else. You know, we'll get an Airbnb for the weekend or something and let you guys sort this out. It wasn't like that. They had to go and work for the promise of God. It's a partnership. And so, right when they get to the city of Jericho, they're right on the Jordan River. And Joshua sends out two spies to the city of Jericho, which is the city that Rahab lived in. She was not an Israelite woman. She was, on paper, an enemy of the Israelites. And so two spies go out there, and the city of Jericho is on, like, high alert. They know that the Israelites are coming. They know the, the patterns of the Israelites in war because of God and his covering. They knew that they had escaped from Egypt. They knew about the Red Sea. All these tales and stories had reached the city of Jericho. So Jericho's like, ooh, we got to, like, put guards at the gates. we got to board this up, lock this down. They were on high alert and so if you're two spies in a city on high alert, you're probably going to be very cautious, very incognito, maybe wear a mustache and glasses. You're going to do something to not be noticed. And so where, where do you go? Uh, hopefully we don't go there. Where would someone maybe go in a city if they didn't want to be noticed or if everyone that went in there kind of snuck around and dodged contact from the community? Maybe a brothel. So the, t the spies find themselves at Rahab, who was a harlot, who was a prostitute. They find themselves at her house, which is, it, it's kind of genius, a good spot to hide. You know, people aren't really going to be wanting to be noticed in that environment. People aren't going to be looking around in that environment. They're going to be more concerned about who's seeing them in that environment. So it's a good spot to hide out. It's a good spot to lay low. And then the, the guards, they come and they start searching because they had heard that these two spies were there. Long story short, they go to Rahab's house. They find out that Rahab, or Rahab hides the spies when the guards get there and then tells this, the guards that they were here. So she tells a half-truth and, and then a little lie. She, but they're, they're gone now. Now, the, the Bible's not advocating lying. It's just recording what happened. Right? I'm not saying that like, hey, Rahab did it so we can do it too. Because she did some stuff that I pray we don't do. Right? I mean, if you're tracking the story, I pray that we aren't doing that too. So, she lies to the guards and sends them away. And then she has this dialogue with the spies, and the spies are telling them, like, telling her, thank you so much, and she basically just brokers this deal. I know, she has a bold declaration of, of faith in who God is. I know what God's done for your, for your army. I know what God's doing for your country. I want to be on your side. And so, they broker this deal where she is going to hang this red cord out of her window when they attack the city, and then everyone of the Israelites that see that red cord will know that she, that's a safe zone. You do not attack the people in that house. They helped us, so we're going to help them. And she sends the spies on their way. They escape. They get back to Joshua, and they plan, a, they plan an attack. Now, I'm going to give you a little window into this. Keep reading after Rahab, because the attack on Jericho is weird. If you were ever in the military or you have friends in the military, you would say that is the worst attack plan I've ever read. But it works because that's what God does. But keep reading. The story of Jericho is rad. But Rahab has this moment where she, she declares who God is. She acknowledges the sovereignty of God. And then she makes a choice to be on the side of God. She made that choice in that moment. You see, that's, that is the the path to that second chance that we're talking about. And 
And on her, on her history, um, I, have a, I have a key verse for today from Romans 8.38, based on her, her profession, the oldest profession, based on that and her, and her second chances, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. I read this story and I'm convinced that nothing Rahab did prevented her from being loved by God. I am convinced that nothing you have done, nothing you will do, could stop God from loving you. I've tried. I've t- I'm sure each of us have a moment where we've tested the limits, where we've gone to the boundary and we stood at the edge and we said, will you still love me, God? Maybe not with our words, but with our actions, with our hearts. Rahab was living on that edge. God showed her love. We got any golfers in the house? Anyone that plays a little golf? Yeah, there's some, there's some. There. Oh, we're getting it, we're getting it. Yes, yes. Anyone familiar with the term mulligan? I want to take a mulligan. That's today's, that, I, that's what I'm calling today's talk. I don't know, I, I was wrestling with it because I'm like, it's Santa Cruz, surf culture, skate culture. I'm a golfer, got to be me. I'm going to take a mulligan. That's what we're calling today. Ray, Rahab took a mulligan. See, I was watching a show called The Big Break. It's an older show. That is, uh, it's a, like a reality competition show, kind of like Survivor or something, but it's for golf. And so these amateur golfers, they go into this competition where they get, you know, they can win challenges and win prizes, but the big break is that they get an opportunity to play in a PGA Tour uh, event. So they get this chance to be a pro for a, 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 a day or a weekend if they play well. And so I'm watching this show because I recently started golfing again. I golfed all through high school. I played, I've played thousands of rounds of golf, more than I could ever imagine. Uh, I worked at a golf course, so it was all free, which was awesome. It's easy to get out for 18 when it's free and you get a cart. Um, so I, I, I've played plenty of golf, and I started golfing again recently. And so I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with it. I'm, in, I, I'm, in, I'm engaged in golf. And so I'm watching the show, and my wife doesn't play golf, doesn't get golf. She thinks it's a, a, a nice walk spoiled. And so she asked me, what is this? What are you watching? So I start telling her, and they had, they, each player got this little medallion called Mulligan Medallion. And she's like, what's a mulligan? So since I'm here, and, and in honor of Chris Matley, I decided to get the definition from wikipedia.com. The, the, de- the definition of a mulligan is a second chance to perform an action, usually after the first chance went wrong through bad luck or a blunder. Its best known meaning is in golf, whereby a player is informally, that's big, informally, allowed to replay a stroke, even though this is against the formal rules of golf. Mulligan, it's a free shot. You get another chance, and it doesn't penalize you. That's, we get a mulligan with God. We get a mulligan with Jesus because he already paid the penalty. You see, we don't get penalized for that stroke. So when you make a blunder, when you, when you shank it out of bounds, you get a mulligan. That's what I'm talking about. We get mulligans. But here's what I told Jill when I was explaining to her the mulligan. You still need to make a good shot after. It's not a free hole in one. You see, my first shot might have been wrong and in the hazard. Just because I get a second chance doesn't guarantee me a perfect shot. Doesn't guarantee me a great shot. It guarantees me another opportunity. It guarantees me a chance. You see, when, when I accepted that call from God ten, um, almost 10 years ago now, for the second time when I got my second chance, I had to still work for it. I had to still read my Bible. I had to still pray. I had to still do things in my life, remove people from my life. I had to make changes and choices. It didn't just fall into place. See, that's, what, that's, that's the, the, the misunderstood thing about a mulligan. Is just because it's a, a penalty-free shot doesn't mean it's a perfect free shot. Rahab still had to make a choice when she went to live with the Israelites. 
She wasn't going to live with the Israelites because she was looking for a new market for her business or a new clientele list. She was looking for a new life. She was looking to... So, oh, I clicked the wrong button. I hate computers sometimes. Sorry. So if you're taking notes, here, here's our first point from Rahab's story. That we don't want to carry old ways into new chances. Don't carry old ways into new chances. The mulligan she had, she still had to make an effort. She still had to take another shot. She didn't carry her old ways into her new chance. Are you looking for a freebie? Or are you looking to grow and get better? Because growth and getting better takes work. Are we willing to put in the work? Are we? It's, if, you're, if you carry your old ways into your new chance, I'm going to let you in on a secret because I can tell the future. It's not going to go well. If you keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result, it's not going to end well for you. I know, it's crazy. You didn't know that I could tell the future. You didn't know that. I used to tell my youth students all the time, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Show me your habits and you can figure out where you're going. Don't carry old ways. See, Acts 3.19 says, Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. That word repentance literally means to turn away from, change course, to alter where you were going. Rahab repented and turned from her lifestyle to a new life, a new place, a new destiny. She took that opportunity, that second chance, and she changed her path. I pray that we are given a second chance, and I pray that we repent from what ruined our first chance, from whatever blunder we made, whatever mistake we had. Have you ever been identified by your sin or your failure? I have. I've been called a liar. I've been called a cheat. I've been called an addict. I've been called lots of things that are based on my actions, my behavior. Anyone else struggle from that where you did something or you had a, a, a failure, a, a, a sin problem, and then people would just label you that? No? Okay, I see some heads nodding. Sorry, the lights are bright. Uh, sometimes I like the lights being too bright to where I can't see people because I'm like, uh, I don't want to make eye contact when someone's like, when it's, you know, talking about sin. But Rahab, Rahab de dealt with this. Rahab dealt with being identified by her sin. Anyone familiar with the red light district, that term? Red light district? Yeah, some people. You've heard it. It's a, it's a term that's kind of culturally known. Well, before there was electricity in Rahab's days, it was a red cord district. Rahab's red cord equaled the red light district. You see, she was known in town if, if, her, if her house was open for business, it was displayed by this red cord at her front door that said, hey, come on in, we're open. So this, the community knew what Rahab was up to just by what was labeled out in front of her door. Just like the labels that we get put on us by others, by things that we have done, things that we are doing, that same way we can be identified by our failures or our sin. You see, the whole town knew who Rahab was. The whole town knew when and what she was up to. She was identified by that. And here's one thing I love about Jesus is that enter, enter the grace of God and Rahab's red cord equals redemption. You see, I've never really questioned or put together the, the, the fact that she just had this red cord in her house. I thought, oh, well, I guess it's just kind of normal in that area. No, for her business it was normal. And the spies used, used that red cord to climb out of her, out of her um, house to get back to Joshua to tell him, what they had found in Jericho, and then used that red cord to symbolize that she would remain safe. See, God took, God takes what the world will look at you as. He will take your failure. He will take your sin. 
He will take your misconstrued identity and redeem it. See, that red cord probably was like a scarlet letter for her to wear around. Probably didn't bring her a lot of confidence or encouragement or comfort or peace in her life. But after, oh, I'm sure it meant the world to her. Because it was a symbol of God's grace. It was a symbol of God's love, and it was a symbol of his redemption for her to get a second chance. God's second chances turn our mess into a message. I know that's kind of cliche and corny. If you've been around church at all, you've probably heard that phrase, a mess into a message. But sometimes cliches are there because they're just true. They're just true. I'm, I'm a living proof that my mess became a message because of Jesus. Without Jesus, it's literally just this mess. With Jesus, it's, it's a message of his grace. See, that, that red cord became, went from being a mess in her life to a message of God's grace. God wants to redeem the false identities in your life. God wants to call you by your true name, loved child of God. Now, Romans 8, 28 through 29 says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them because to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. See, God knew what Rahab was up to. God also knew that she was called a daughter of the living king. So he orchestrated and, and involved himself to bring the opportunity for a second chance. Now, Rahab could have denied it. She could have said no. Sometimes you forget about the humanity of these people in this, in this, in this book of life here. She could have just said no and been scared and turned the spies in. What would have happened there? It was, still would have been a second chance, just a second chance not taken. Have you missed your second chance? With Jesus, you haven't. Because he'll keep, he'll keep offering it. He'll keep giving you. You see, we serve the God of redemption, not the redo. The God of redemption, not the... She didn't get a redo at life. She didn't start over. It wasn't a video game where you just hit reset and go back to the beginning. Her past was still her past. Her thoughts were still her thoughts. Her behaviors and habits and tendencies were still there. She had to forge a new path. With God, she had to grow and work. It was a redemption, not a redo. But what did she do with her mulligan? What did she do? Yeah, sure, she helped the Israelites. That's cool. After the story of Rahab and Jericho, there's not much that's said about her. The rest of her life is kind of a mystery. But here's, here's one thing that leads me to this conclusion that she played her mulligan well. Her legacy. Her legacy stood the test of time. You see, she actually, she went from a prostitute to a princess. She married a prince. And then that prince and her had babies. One was Boaz, who had Obed, who had Jesse, who had King David. And Jesus was in the line of David. Jesus was in the lineage and the line of Rahab. I would say she used her mulligan pretty well. If you went from a brothel in Jericho to a palace and the great, great, great fill-in-the-blank grandmother of Jesus, I'd say you made a good turn. I'd say it worked out for you. You played it well. You took and made the most of your second chance. And I love here that when you look at that the, the, the heart the blood of Jesus that was in his heart beating had the blood of a foreign woman of the past. I, if that doesn't say Jesus loves us all in a culture where, where that wasn't things to love, Jesus says, my blood beats with it. His heart beat for the people on the fringe. His heart beat for the people who needed a second chance. And it beats 
today for people to come closer to Him. His DNA, His, his innate being is for everyone, foreign, male, female alike. Anyone and everyone is welcome at the feet of Jesus. And he died and stretched out his arms for anyone. You have this second chance. So I want to leave us with this thought. What will you do with yours? Do you have a legacy that points to Jesus? Will you allow him to redeem the sin in your life? Will you allow him to take what the enemy meant to destroy you to be your weapon to expand the kingdom. See, I'm reminded of the story of David, David and Goliath. David, a young boy, used a sling to kill a giant. Well, almost. He used the sling to knock the giant out and used the giant's own sword to kill him. And then years later, on the run from Saul, went to the temple, and Elimelech said, the only weapon we have in the temple is the sword of Goliath, whom you killed some years ago. And David said, I'll take that one. There's no sword like it. See, the sword that was intended to destroy David, the sword that was intended to end and kill David, was the sword David carried the rest of his life to do the work of the Lord. The enemy will try to use your past to harm you, but the Lord will redeem your past to bless people. If we could have the band come up and bow our heads, I want to pray over us. Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so much that (laughs) you're the God of second chances. You're the God of life who gently nudges and taps our heart that says, yeah, you, you, you tell us like it is. You say, yeah, you messed up. But yeah, I got a plan for that. Yeah, I can help you through that. I'm going to love you through that. Thank you for that, Jesus. And I want to give an opportunity right now. If there's anyone here that has never accepted the, the free, redeeming second chance of Jesus, who died on the cross to save you from your sin, If you've never said yes to Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity right now to say yes to Jesus and and accept that second chance and play a mulligan in your life. I'll give you a minute. Lord, I also want to pray for anyone who's sitting here saying, hey, I need to to tee up another one. I I need a mulligan in my life. I'm a follower of Jesus. I've just gotten off track. I'm not not where I want to be. I'm not in step with the Holy Spirit. I want to pray with you right now that 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 is just an ask away from Jesus. Just ask him, Jesus, can I have a second chance? Can Can I get another opportunity to follow you better? I can tell you right now the answer is yes. Lord, I want to lift up our hearts and our and our community as we as we get ready to, to go and be the light, Lord, that we, we get a chance to go out and point people to you, to help people find and follow you, Jesus. And as the band starts to play, we're going to respond.